Rao Bhimashankaram 1.6, our specific focus will be on 1.6.6, that theorem. The theorem starts with a vector space V with two subspaces, not just subsets, subspaces S and T of V. Then the theorem constructs two more subspaces out of S and T. One is S intersection t and the other is s plus t. Now let us quickly remember what is meant by s plus t. s plus t is as a set all elements of v that can be written as little s plus little t where little s belongs to capital S and little t belongs to capital T. So as a set it is this set. Now, it also turns out to be a subspace that can be seen quite easily because if I take any two such elements S1 and T1, S2 and T2, then if I add them up, what shall I get? I shall again get some element of S because S is a subspace plus some element of T because that is also a subspace. So, this will again belong to S plus T. The same argument will hold if I multiply this with some scalar alpha 1 and this with some scalar alpha 2 and then add. So, any linear combination of elements of S plus T will again lie in S plus T which shows that this has to be a subspace. Coming back to the theorem, this theorem relates their dimensions. It says that if you take dimension of this, plus you take dimension of this, then you will get dimension of S plus dimension of T. Now, the theorem as it has been stated is a very typical example of Raghima Shankaramish way of statement. We deliberately present things so that you cannot see the obvious connection between this and something that you already know. If we just take this term, on this side, then you cannot fail to notice the connection between this and the very popular inclusion exclusion principle, which says if A and B are any two sets, finite sets, in that case the size of the union is given by size of A plus size of B minus the intersection. Here, the role of union is played by the sum, the role of size is played by dimension, then you get precisely the same result. So, if we know how to prove this, we have hope of being able to prove that result. Now, there are various ways of proving this. The most popular, the most common, the common sense way of going about it is you count all the elements here. Suppose there are got four elements. So, this is 4 and you count all the elements here, suppose 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, it is 4 plus 5, but then you notice that these two elements have been counted twice. So, you subtract one copy of them and you, this is why the exclusion part. Now, this way of thinking does not generalize easily to proving this result, but there is another way of going about proving the same result. It is like this you first start by counting the intersection part and then you count the part which is like a moon of all the elements in A but that are not in B. So, you first start by counting these, then you count these and then you finally count this. So, you express A union B as union as disjoint union of these three sets and you add them up and then also you come to the same conclusion. This way can be extended quite easily to prove this result. So, let us uh, do the proof. Here I have shown still as a Venn diagram my subspaces. What I do is I will start by counting elements in S intersection T. However, it is not number of elements that we are interested in, but the dimension which is number of 
elements in a basis. So that's what I will do. I will start by taking a basis of S intersection T. So since S intersection T is uh, <coughs> a subspace, so if it, it must have a basis and we are working with finite dimensional vector spaces here. So I should better add that, that is a finite dimensional vector space. And if it happens to be the trivial vector space, then also it has a basis in the sense the basis is the empty set. So I start by taking a basis of S intersection T. So I can see this K is actually dimension of S intersection T. Well, then what I do is I count this, which basically means I count the dimension of this, but the problem is this, this crescent shaped thing is not a subspace anymore, so I cannot say take a basis of that. However, I can take a basis of the entire thing, starting with these three vectors, because I know if I have any independent set, I can grow that into a basis, which is a very useful theorem. So, these three vectors constitute a basis of this intersection, so they are linearly independent and they are all in S, so I can extend it to a basis of entire S. V1 to Vk, we already had this part and this is the extension part Vk plus 1 to Vk plus R, you must understand that R may be equal to 0, in which case this part is just not there. So, R becomes a dimension of S or maybe, <coughs> oh no, R is not dimension of S, I mean uh, R, K plus R is dimension of S. Maybe I should make a note of that fact that it is K plus R and this one is R, sorry, this one is K. Okay, now my aim is to do the same thing over here. So, what I will do is I will extend this to a basis of T because these are linearly independent and also part of T. So, I want to explore this part for that. So, I have already taken some vectors. These new vectors clearly cannot be inside this. So, my new vectors are somewhere here. We have already got those things. Now, I am trying to get something here. So, I shall again start from these and extend that to a basis of T. So, I again started with the same basis, I have given it a name, script B, to a basis of T. So, I am starting with this and growing it in this way, again starting with this and growing it in that way. So, I get some elements here. Now, I can see that the dimension of T is K plus So, if I now do the arithmetic, I can see that one copy of k cancels off and you are left with r plus p plus k. That is all these elements. Now, my claim is that all these elements, the black ones and the red ones and the blue ones, they will constitute a basis of s plus t. So, if I can show that, I will immediately get here k plus R plus P, K plus R plus P and that will establish the result. So, all that I need to show now is that these elements, these black, red and blue elements will constitute a basis of S plus T. So, I want to show that all these things will constitute a basis of S plus T. Now, there is a little a notational mistake that I did there because I called these things V k plus 1, V k plus 2, etc. Then I again call this V k plus 1. So, you understand uh, when I extend this, I should have used a different notation. So, the red things and, not, and the blue things, they are not the same. So, I should not have used the same V k plus 1, but you get the idea and I am using different colors here. So, to show that this is a basis, first of all, I have to show that all these things are inside S plus T, which is straightforward, because all these things are inside S, so they are inside S plus T, these are inside T, so they are also inside S plus T, so they are all in the right vector space. 
Now I have to show that they together will span S plus T. So if you take any factor in S plus T, it will be of the form some little s plus some little t. Now since one part of it is in little s, this little s can be expressed as a linear combination of these things because they constitute a basis of capital S. Similarly, when you look at T, they can be expressed as a linear combination of these and these. So, the together everything will express as a linear combination of all these things because sum of linear combinations is again a linear combination. So, I can see that these things indeed span S plus T. So, the only thing that remains to be shown uh, is that this set is a linearly independent set. Okay, so to show that they are linearly independent, I can proceed in this way. I will take a linear combination of all these things that is equal to 0 and show that the coefficients individually must be 0. So here is my linear combination. I have used a different notation slightly. I have called them S1 to SR. These are V1 to Vk as originally and I have called them T1 to Tp. So, S and Vs and Ts are vectors and alphas and betas and gamma, they are scalars. And I am setting this equal to 0. Now, focus your attention on this part and also separately on this part. So, one is negative of the other because they add up to 0. Now, this part belongs to S because these are all in S. Similarly, this part or its negative belongs to T. Since one is negative of each other, so this part also belongs to T and this part also belongs to S. In other words, I can say that this part belongs to both S and to T. It belongs to T because it is a linear combination of elements in T. It belongs to S because this is negative of something which belongs to S. In other words, this belongs to not just T but to intersection of S and T. And that is immediately a problem because this is a linear combination of then this part because anything which is inside S intersection T must be a linear combination of the black things. But I said that these things are linearly independent of that because I extended this to a basis. All these things together constitute a basis. So the only way this can happen is when this is 0 and this is also 0. So now I can see that separately this must be 0 and this must be 0. Now, if this is equal to 0 separately, I can see that all these things, these things together constitute a basis, so they are linearly independent, which means all the alpha i's and beta j's separately are equal to 0. Similarly, if I come to this, my this set is not it's not basis of entirety but it's a linearly independent set so the coefficients gamma 1 to gamma p must also be equal to 0 and that shows that this set must be linearly independent completing the proof of the theorem now from the theorem you can draw an obvious corollary to understand the corollary let's first again look at inclusion exclusion principle as we did for a Venn diagram and there we know that one obvious corollary of this is if I consider size of A union B I know it can never exceed size of A plus size of P and the reason was this that if you count all the elements of A plus all the elements of B you might be overcounting the elements in the intersection. Or maybe there is no overcounting if this intersection happens to be empty, but this can never exceed that. And the rigorous proof was that from inclusion exclusion principle, I know this is this, and 
size of A intersection B, whatever that is, can never be negative. So, you are taking this quantity, subtracting some non-negative quantity to arrive at this. So, this must be less than or equal to that. So, that was the way we drew that corollary. Well, we can do the same thing here. I can see that dimension of S plus T is dimension of T plus dimension of T minus something which is definitely non-negative could be 0. So, clearly this fellow must be less than or equal to that fellow. And this completes the proof of the corollary.